Hello, this is Mr. Field, and this is my video on evolution. Now, before you watch this, make sure you're confident on the basics of animal, plant, and bacterial cells, the structure of DNA and genetics. I've got videos on all of those things earlier in this playlist if you need. Now, in this video, we'll start off by looking at the different domains of life. Then we'll explore natural selection, evolution, bacterial resistance, which is an example of evolution. We'll look at the way humans evolved, and then we'll briefly address some of the kind of common misconceptions about evolution. Now, let's start by looking at what we call the three domains of life. Now, this is about how we classify and put living things into groups. And it used to be that all organisms were categorized into five different kingdoms. So we had animals like us, plants, fungi, you know, mushrooms and things like that protists and prokaryotes like bacteria. However, as we learned more and more about genetics and DNA and we did more analysis of their genes, what we began to realize is that there were lots of things that appeared like they were very different, but actually their genes were quite similar. And so analysis of these genes showed us that there was a better way to classify living things. And so we came up with this model called the three domains model of living things. Now, According to this, there are three domains of life, three major groups of types of living thing. Group number one is called eukaryota, and that includes us. We are examples of the eukaryota domain. So this eukaryota includes animals, plants, and fungi, but also protists and quite a lot of other different types of organism as well. Uh, a lot of those are single celled things that you know I'm not familiar with and I, I imagine you wouldn't be either. Now, all the things in the eukaryota domain, all the organisms there, they have cells that have a nucleus, okay? And also their DNA contains unused sections. So if you look at the human genome, there are huge stretches of the human genome that don't seem to have any particular purpose. You know, they're not actually genes, they're not actually coding for different proteins, they're just there. And that's a feature of the DNA in organisms from the eukaryota domain. The next domain is bacteria, and there are two main types of bacteria. Um, there's the regular old bacteria, but also another group called cyanobacteria. Um, and these cells, they have no nucleus this time and also their DNA contains no unused sections. They've only got useful parts of their DNA. And the last group that we've got is the archaea. Now these used to be considered bacteria, but actually we know now that they're very, that they're very different from this genetic analysis. So these are things like halophiles and thermophiles. You don't need to worry what those things are. It is worth noting that they, you've got lots of archaea in your gut, so archaea are actually the main microorganisms that cause methane to be produced when you fart. Now, in terms of their cells, their cells have no nucleus again, but a bit more like the eukaryota, they have DNA that contains unused sections. So in terms of the structure of their cells, they're sort of somewhere between the bacteria and the eukaryota cells. Now, we're going to get on to looking at evolution and how that works. But before we do, we need to get our head around some terminology. And um, we're going to start with this idea of natural selection. Now, to understand natural selection, we need to understand what we mean by this phrase, adaptations. Now, an adaptation is a characteristic that enables an organism to survive. So you've got lots of different adaptations yourself. You know, you've got hands that allow you to grasp things. You've got that marvelous brain that lets you think and solve problems. You've got your muscle, you know, your legs that let you run away from danger and towards, you know, animals that you're hunting. You've got, you know, all sorts of other different adaptations that enable you to survive. Now, you've, there's also variation. So variation we saw in the last uh, video is about the differences between individuals. And that variation is largely caused by random mutations to the DNA that happen during reproduction. Now, variation makes some members of a species better adapted to survive. Variation that me means that some individuals are going to be stronger. 
or faster or more intelligent or better able to store fat for the winter or better able to resist the harmful effects of ultraviolet light or better able to resist certain diseases. And so there's all this different variation, but that variation means that some individuals are better adapted to survive than others. And that leads to this idea of natural selection. Natural selection is the idea that individuals with the best adaptations are more likely to survive, to breed, and then to pass on their genes. We, we sometimes refer to this as well as survival of the fittest. Now just notice that more likely bit. Um, this is all just a game of chance, you know. Being bigger and stronger will make you more likely to be able to run away from a tiger or something. But it doesn't mean you won't just be unlucky. You know, maybe you trip and fall down, a, fall into a cave or something, you know. So, so bad luck still happens. But the whole point of natural selection is that the individuals with the best adaptations are more likely to be able to survive. Now, what natural selection does is it enables evolution. So let's look at that on the next slide. So Darwin's theory of evolution by natural selection. Now, what this is telling us about, this is telling us is where do new species come from? Okay, Because if you look at our glorious planet Earth, there are tens of millions of different species of living organisms. And the big question is, where do they come from? The answer to that question is Darwin's theory of evolution by natural selection. Now, evolution, it, it's difficult to kind of, um, you know, exactly pin it down to one single set of steps. But if you did, it might look something like this. So it starts with, first of all, the idea of variation. Variation tells us that organisms, whilst they are well adapted, that means they've got suitable features for their environment, there is also some variation. So no two individuals are identical. So let's imagine we had some wild sheep. Okay, So there's my cute little wild sheep. They are all well adapted to where they live, but there is variation. The variation we're going to look at this time, uh, concentrate on is the is their height. You can see some of them are really tall and some of them have got tiny little stumpy legs like that. And that's an example of that variation. Okay, now, the next thing that happens is there is, in, in, in evolution, is, is there'll be some kind of environmental change. Okay. That could be climate change. That's what we're seeing right now. And, you know, global warming is going to be a big driver of evolution over the coming thousands of years. Okay. Um, it could be a new predator moves into the area, maybe a new disease, maybe a new food source. Maybe there'll be a, be, be a geological change, you know, a big volcano or, or something like that. But there will be some kind of environmental change. In our sheep example, what we're going to um, say is that a new predator moves into the area that, is very picky and only eats animals that are less than one meter tall. So anyone below this dotted orange line there. Now, what we get then is the idea of survival of the fittest. So what this means is that some individuals have variation that makes them better adapted to survive the new conditions and others may die. So in my sheep example, any individuals that are taller than one meter will be left alone by our scary new predator and they get to survive but unfortunately the shorties the ones that are below a meter they get eaten by the predator and they are removed from the game of life now this is then le then leads to natural selection our better adapted individuals can survive and really importantly they can breed and that means that they can pass on the genes for their better adaptations, get passed on to their offspring, and they spread throughout the population. That doesn't mean there are no more short sheep left, but it does mean that on average, the sheep are now taller because the taller ones have survived and passed on their taller genes, and so there are now more sheep with tall sheep genes. Okay? We call that process inheritance, the way that those good genes get passed on to the next generation by natural selection. Now, natural sele th this, this kind of process continues for generations. And so again, we see the ones that are more than a metre tall manage to survive the, uh, the, uh, the threat of the new predator, whilst the, um, whilst the shorties end up getting killed again. They get eaten, they turned into roast lamb or something. Um, and they die out and they play no far, further part. Now, 
This process continues uh, on for a while, and it may well be that the the predator, you know, now it's now it's running out of um, running out of food, changes its appetites and starts picking on animals that are now below 1.2 meters tall. And so now, only these guys meet our new uh, height requirement, and the shorter ones die. And so again, the even taller ones they get to pass on their their genes and produce an even taller set of sheep. You know, we've got these giant, crazy, long-legged sheep. They're going to be giraffes if we carry on much longer. So that's the last kind of key thing with uh, evolution, is that it happens over many generations. You know, evolution doesn't happen you know, in, the, in the lifespan of a single sheep. You can't even really notice it over the, life, you know, over, the, over the course of a few generations. It takes many, many generations with many, many small changes adding up over tens, hundreds, mil hundreds of thousands, millions of years to eventually lead to an entirely new species to be evolved. And we call that process of new species developing re is referred to as speciation. Now, a really good example of evolution is shown to us by uh, what we call bacterial resistance. Now, antibiotic resistance is a really annoying thing. It's when bacteria are no longer affected by the antibiotics that are intended to kill them. You know, so if you go into hospital, for example, um, and to have an operation, they will always give you a load of antibiotics to just kill any bacteria that might have got into your body whilst you'd been cut open. The big problem we've got is that a lot of those antibiotics now don't work as well as they used to because of the evolution of antibiotic resistance. And this is a really good kind of case study of exactly how evolution works. So it worked a little bit like this. So we started with variation. So some bacteria naturally have genes that make them slightly resistant to the antibiotics. That might look like this. So our green ones, these are the kind of the normal bacteria and the yellow ones are the ones that have got those slight resistance genes. So we get our environmental change. In this case, the environmental change is that the person starts taking antibiotics and that's changed the environment that the bacteria are living in. So all of the green ones, they end up um, getting killed by the antibiotics. That is the idea of natural selection. The resistant bacteria um, survive and reproduce whilst the others die. So these ones, they get to reproduce. So we then get the idea of inheritance. So those resistant ones reproduce and they pass on their resistance genes. So now there are lots of bacteria that are now slightly resistant to the um, antibiotics. However, we also get some mutation. Okay? So some of those resistant bacteria, as they are dividing, they end up getting mutations that make them even more resistant. That's the orange ones now. Okay? And so we get this kind of cycle. So we take more antibiotics and the kind of slightly resistant ones, they end up dying, but the bit more resistant ones, they end up surviving and they get to pass on their genes to the next generation. But again, some of them will mutate and make our super harmful dark red ones. And you can kind of see how this can go on. Now, really important is that as we take more and more of the antibiotics, eventually the amount of antibiotics gets so high that even the most resistant bacteria in our bodies are killed by them. The problem happens when we don't take our full course of antibiotics. Uh, and that means that we end up allowing those most resistant ones to survive and carry on breeding uh, and dividing. And they can eventually get even more harmful mutations. So the, the kind of lesson from the evolution of antibacterial resistance is to make sure that you do take your full course of antibiotics um, whenever you're prescribed it. Now, one of the big questions that has faced humankind throughout our history is where did humans come from? And the answer to that is very clearly we evolved. We evolved in the exact same way that all of the other species on Earth did. Now, humans first evolved around 300 thousand years ago that's a very very long time ago you know we we often think about you know um the calendar we use started in the year zero which is when jesus was born over two thousand years ago that seems like a long time ago but this is 150 times longer ago than that now a common misconception is that humans evolved from 
chimpanzees, we didn't. Uh, both humans and chimpanzees evolved from a common ancestor, some kind of other simpler ape that lived at least 5 million years ago, but perhaps as much as 13 million years ago. Now, between that common ancestor and us, there have been quite a lot of different species um, that have all been more and more closely related to us. And we need to know about four of them. And we've got fossil evidence of all of these. So number one, species number one is Ardi. Now, the full name of Ardi is Ardipithecus rabidus, but just Ardi is fine. Ardi was a human ancestor that lived 4.4 million years ago. And you can see Ardi here. Now, Ardi was not a human. But Ardi was also not a chimpanzee either. Ardi is some kind of um, ape-like creature that is, you know, definitely more upright than a chimpanzee, taller and slend more slender than a chimpanzee, um, but definitely also not quite like us. Either, you know, much shorter, more stooped, not walking so upright, things like that. Okay. Our next one that we need to know about is Lucy. Now, the full name of Lucy is Australopithecus afarensis, but you don't need that. Just knowing that Lucy knowing the name Lucy is fine. So this one here is Lucy. And again, you can see Lucy is a bit more like us and a bit less like Ardi. Um, Lucy was around about 3.2 million years ago. Our next ancestor that we think about, um, well, there are two of them actually, both discovered by members of the Leakey family. Um, the Leakeys were Mary Leakey and her husband, um, uh, Lewis, and then their son, Jonathan, as well. And they did lots of work um, on, on dig sites, uncovering um, some of our ancient uh, human ancestors. So they discovered Homo habilis. So Homo habilis was around about 2.3 million years ago. Now Homo habilis, the name actually stands for handy man. And the reason why we say handy is because Homo habilis was found alongside lots of stone tools that they had made. Um, and then also there was Homo erectus as well. That erectus word, that means upright. It's been the source of laughter for generations of school children. Um, but I'm afraid it just means upright. It's nothing ruder than that. Um, Homo erectus was around about 2 million years ago. And again, you can see, so this is Habilis here. And this is Homo um, uh, erectus. Um, and again, you can see there's that gradual change from, from, uh, from Ardi here definitely not particularly human-like to uh, Homo erectus, who if we saw Homo erectus walking around, you know, down the high street, we'd probably think that guy looks a bit funny, but we certainly wouldn't question that it was a human. So we can see this definite change and transition towards more human-like um, uh, species. Now, if we look at the fossils, we see particular patterns. Pattern number one is that we see an increase in the skull volume. So for example, Ardi, Ardi's skull volume was about 300 centimetres cubed. Lucy's skull volume was about uh, 450 centimetres cubed. Homo habilis was about 600 centimetres cubed. And Homo erectus was about 1,000 centimetres cubed. And that compares with us, Homo sapiens, whose brains are about 1,300 centimetres cubed. So you can see there's that gradual increase in brain volume suggesting an increase in intelligence over time. Also, the um, fossils become increasingly more upright. So as far as we can tell, Lucy was around 120 centimetres. Um, so uh, Ardi was around 120. Lucy was around 140 centimetres. Homo habilis was around 150 centimetres. And um, uh, Homo erectus was around 160 centimetres. And again, for reference, the average Homo sapiens now is around 170 centimetres. Um, so you can see, again, there's this gradual change. Now, you don't need to know the details of the numbers, but you do need to know that gradual trend in increased skull volume and becoming increasingly upright. Whilst fossils provide one line of evidence for human evolution, stone tools provide another. Now, many fossils of human ancestors are found alongside stone tools. And what we find is that the older fossils um, are accompanied by simpler stone tools, whilst the younger, newer, more recent fossils are accompanied by more sophisticated stone tools. So, for example, if we look here, um, this is a stone tool that might have come from Homo, um, uh, Homo habilis. 
And you can see it's pretty basic looking. It's a rock that's been definitely shaped for a specific purpose, probably for chopping, but it's, you know, it's not that kind of detailed. A more recent stone tool, like this one, found alongside Homo erectus fossils, this shows a lot more detail. Like, you know, it's more finely, more subtly shaped. Um, and then if we look at these ones, these aren't from Homo sapiens. These are actually from another species called Neanderthals. So these are Homo uh, neanderthalensis. So these, you can see, again, they've got much more detail. They're, they're smaller, they're more finely shaped. Um, so you can see there's that gradual transition from older and more simple to newer and more sophisticated. Now, what this suggests is that more sophisticated tools require greater intelligence to make them. Okay, You don't need to be clever to make that. You need to be quite clever to make one of these. And so that provides evidence for the evolution of intelligence. And that matches with what we know about the brain volume. We know that Homo habilis had a smaller brain. And we know that Neanderthals had a bigger brain. And this is evidence of that bigger brain leading to greater intelligence. Now, it's worth noting it can be hard to accurately date stone tools. And the reason why is because the stones the tools are made from are much older than the tools themselves are. And so what we have to do is we have to age them by aging the sediments, you know, the soil and dirt and other stuff that they're buried alongside. Now, I want to finish up by just talking about a few misconceptions, misunderstandings to do with evolution. Um, so misunderstanding number one is the idea that evolution happens to populations, not to individuals. So people often say, you know, well, why aren't I evolving? And the reason why you're not is because an individual can't evolve um, because sexual reproduction leads to the variation that enables natural selection. You can't evolve. Um, you are not a Pokemon. Second misconception is around evolution being just a theory. Yes, evolution is a theory, but really it's better to think of it as a scientific fact. The reason I say that is because a lot of people just don't understand what the word theory means in the context of science. Um, a theory is just our best, our, our best explanation of the evidence that we've got. And actually every single thing that we teach you in science is a theory. You know, our knowledge about atoms and chemicals and how they bond, that's all a theory. Our knowledge of gravity, that's a theory. Our knowledge of energy and forces, that's a theory. Our knowledge of cells uh, and how they work, that's a theory as well. All of those things are theories, but that doesn't mean we don't think they're true. That just means that's what the word theory means in science. Theory is our best explanation of the evidence we've got. And so yeah, evolution is a theory, but it's not just a theory. It's a theory that's supported by an extraordinary amount of evidence. It's there is so much evidence behind it that, you know, you to all intents and purposes, we can consider it to be a fact. Next misconception is around um, uh, uh, how evolved we are compared to how evolved other organisms are. Now, I don't want to burst your bubble. You are no more evolved than an ant. It's just that you are differently evolved. Um, in fact, if you think about something like an ant or a fly, because those organisms reproduce far more quickly and have generations many times a year rather than just once every kind of 15, 20 years, in some ways, because they've gone through more generations, we could actually think of them as being more evolved. So it's not really about some species being more and less evolved. It's just that we're all differently evolved to meet different needs within the, um, uh, within the environment. And the last misconception is the idea that humans uh, and apes and indeed all life have somehow stopped evolving. We haven't. Humans are still evolving and there are, you know, wild apes, you know, chimpanzees, whatever. They're also still evolving. The trouble is that the changes produced by evolution are far too slow to see on a human lifespan. You know, we wouldn't see measurable difference between us and future humans, you know, in, in much less than sort of 100,000 years or so. That's the kind of time scale over which we start to see meaningful changes uh, in terms of evolution. Okay, there we are. That's it. The end. As always, thank you for listening and well done if you got this far.